Hey everybody, Hoosier Jedi here with another review for you. This time I'm talking episode 5 of season 2 of Riverdale, When a Stranger Calls. And I thought this was another really strong episode. We find out a lot more about what's going on inside the, the Black Hood's head. And, I mean, there's just really, really interesting stuff going on with pretty much everybody. So let's just kind of get right into it. Uh, the stuff with the Black Hood, of course, is the real main crux of this. And we start to understand a little bit more of what's going on with his fascination with Betty. We don't really know why he's fascinated, but we do know a little, a lot more about, you know, how this guy's mind works. And it's interesting that he really just says, you know, that he, he's, he, that he just even describes himself as selfish, that he wants Betty to himself. And he basically says like, look, if you don't cut your friends out of your life, I'll, I've got a list of I've got a ready-made BS reason to kill any of them and feel perfectly justified in doing so. Uh, now, granted, this is a little bit more believable with Jughead giving his connection to the ser serpents, but Veronica, I mean, really, she's basically just guilty of being Hiram Lodge's daughter. There's really no proof that Veronica's done much of anything bad. In fact, she's you know, despite, despite a bad moment here or there, been a genuinely positive force in Riverdale. I mean, Veronica's got her flaws, but at the end of the day, she's pretty much a good person. Which is, uh, you know, TV show Veronica is, I think, a fair bit nicer than comic book Veronica, but nonetheless, she is, a, at the end of the day, a genuinely good person. Um, which, you know, just really goes to the fact that the, the, the Hood is basically an enormous hypocrite. I mean, he even describes himself as selfish, and yet he's concerned with punishing quote-unquote sinners. Well, last time I checked, selfishness was a form of greed, um, and, you know, thus, you know, sinful. But, you know, the, the Black Hood is not a guy who's clearly thinking uh, terribly rationally, so let's just kind of roll with that. Um, but it is interesting that Betty is able to get out of him that if I, if I were, that if she were to see him without the mask, she would know who he is, which I think is very very interesting. So this means it's 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 somebody that we know, which of, okay of course it is. You know it's not interesting if he's a complete stranger, but you know thinking of mulling over trying to figure out who it is, I did kind of remember something. Didn't they say back in season one that Hal and Alice had a son uh, you know, as a result of teen pregnancy back when they were in high school and that the kid got given up for adoption? I mean, seriously, I'm, I'm not just pulling that out of thin air, right? So I can't help but wonder. So let's just kind of put a pin in that as something to kind of think on. Now, as for who it actually might be, uh, yeah, I'm really drawing a blank here. Uh, if there's an established character on the show that is potentially the Black Hood, and from everything we've seen, it looks like this is a full-fledged adult man, uh, just kind of given the nature of whoever it is they have under that hood. Um, the idea that, so, so I don't really think it's going to turn out to be like somebody, uh, somebody at the school. I mean, you look at the Black Hood, you do see someone who is genuinely adult, not a teenager. So, yeah, I'm really kind of scratching my head on that one. I mean, granted, they could always kind of pull a switcheroo on us, but that would be like, wait a minute, you're kidding me. There's no way this person was the Black Hood. They look nothing like whoever it is, is the, under the mask right now. Probably some stuntman. But, you know, whatever. Um, let's see, so what else here? Yeah, uh, the hood just sort of screwing with Betty, trying to cut, have her cut all these people out of her life, is, I mean, he does a really nice job of it. At the end of the day, you know, Betty is once again pissed off her mom, albeit her running that article was a little bit more justified than her other actions, given uh, the way Alice has acted. But, um, you know, that, uh, you know, that verbal beatdown that she gives to Veronica. Well, the nice thing about that is is that it is somewhat rooted in truth, and I really like that Betty was just like, like, you know, oh, you're mad at me, Veronica? Well, are you going to get your daddy to put out a hit on you? I mean, basically more or less saying that Hiram is not above committing murder to get what he wants, 
Well, that's something that more than a few people have been implied, but flat out saying it to Veronica's face, I mean, ouch. Especially when it comes on the heels of her dad's basically saying like, okay, you want to be a part of the, the, the business? You want to seat at the table? Well, go get this Nick to convince his dad to give us money. So, I mean, a double ouch there. It's really just basically petty verbalizing like all the worst ideas that people have about Veronica, even though she knows perfectly well that it's not true, but still brutal nonetheless. And uh, doubly that, the situation with Jughead, I mean, sending Archie to basically break up with him for her, I mean, again, ouch. And of course it all has to happen at the worst possible time. <laughs> Archie's pretty damn lucky he got out of that situation without a major ass kicking. Um, <clears throat> of course, you know, the Black Hood finding out what happened with Archie, well, that's not really a big surprise, given that, like, after the whole situation in the house, one of the first things that Betty did is, is whip out her phone and call Archie. So she knows for a fact the Black Hood is close by and has been keeping tabs on her, so that's almost certainly how he knew that Betty had uh, not kept up her whole I'm going to keep this whole situation secret thing. So bad move on Betty's part there. Um, let's see. Nothing really particular to say about Hiram this episode. It is interesting, though, that he's still in some pretty deep financial waters. I mean, he's able to play around. He's got some room to maneuver, but he's got a, He's got this deal, this uh, Sodale, South Riverdale thing that he's got to make work, or he's really up the creek. And it's going to be interesting to see what happens there, you know, just how ruthless is this guy willing to be? And, uh, man, if you've read the comic, especially if you've read like, some of like the Archie Marries Betty or Archie Marries Veronica comics, holy crap, Hiram can be a seriously ruthless son of a bitch. Um, and, and, of course, it's even crazier on the TV show, so God only knows what he's going to end up doing. Uh, particularly, you have to wonder, well, isn't Hiram basically like the biggest target and possible target in all of Riverdale for the Black Hood. So, you know, why isn't he making more of an effort to go after, you know, the juiciest target around? Then again, Hiram's not an idiot, so he's probably taken some precautions, or at least understands how to keep himself safe. So you, you never know. It, it'll be interesting. Um, so this also brings, speaking of Veronica, brings us to the whole situation with Nick St. Clair. Um, and, man, oh man, what a dirtbag this guy is. It, it, I mean, it's really easy to see why Betty does end up choosing him. I mean, he tried to rape Cheryl. I mean, what, what can you really say about that? I'm, man, I mean, people who do stuff like that, it's just... I mean, they're just the, like, perfect examples of the absolute worst side of humanity. So you can see that even... T but it does speak well to Betty that she, well, she does give the guy up. Even then, she's extraordinarily reluctant to do so. It's only when basically her sister, for all intents and purposes, has a gun to her head that she gives the guy up. Which does speak well to Betty. Even, you know, an attempted rapist does not deserve to be murdered, as far as Betty's concerned, until her own sister is kind of put on the line in comparison to his life. And given that situation, it's hard to think that almost anybody would make that choice that Betty did. Um, and I did like that they did take the time to flesh Nick out a little bit. You see that he's a very manipulative person, a very selfish person, and you can almost believe that he's genuinely contrite, but then he turns it right back around and he's even worse than before. So, yeah, very, very, yeah, very manipulative guy. And I really did like the way they handled the whole situation with with the, the Pussycats and Veronica. Like, like, hey, wait a minute. Something funny is going on here. We're not going to let this down. We're going to go over there and make sure that Cheryl's okay. And when it turns out Cheryl is very much not okay, they go in there and beat the hell out of this guy, which was extremely satisfying to watch. And I also like that in this situation, 
any differences that the pussy that Veronica and Cheryl might have had in the past are immediately thrown out the window. I mean, nobody even remarks on this because let's face it, at the end of the day, um, you know, a power struggle over a high school cheerleading team is basically petty nonsense compared to someone almost being raped. And I mean, I mean, I really like how everyone handles this. It's like, okay, you know what? There, there might be a little bit of bad blood here, but no way are we going to even risk the possibility that something bad is going to happen to Cheryl. And when they find out what's going on, they immediately and utterly put a stop to it. And nobody hesitates to do everything they can to make, make this guy pay and to comfort Cheryl afterwards. And I do like that immediately Cheryl is like, I'm pressing charge. I want to press charges against this guy. There's no dilly-dallying about it. And I thought that was really great. And it shows you that as emotionally messed up as Cheryl is under these extremely uh, understandable circumstances, that she's still, um, you know, not someone to mess with. It's like, okay, this guy picked a really, really bad fight to start because uh, Cheryl is one, it knows more than a little bit about being ruthless when she needs to. So, yeah, one way or another, this Nick dude is in deep, deep trouble, and he deserves it. <sighs> Let's see here. Oh, yeah. Um, of course, we can't forget about the whole situation with Jughead joining the Serpents, and I do like how they explain it. It's basically, it's like, look, I have to stop these guys. I have to kind of step in here, try to take get some sort of a position of leadership just to keep these guys under control, because if we don't, they're going to go out and do something extraordinarily stupid, and people are probably going to die. I mean, Sweet Bee is talking about going around and setting off a bomb. And, I mean, Tony really, really does lay it out, is that, you know, Jughead's dad was basically keeping idiots and hotheads like Sweet Pea in line so that this, they didn't go out and do something really bad. I mean, if the serpents go and set off a bomb somewhere, that's going to bring the feds down on them. Almost certainly. And, okay, at the end of the day, these guys are a local gang in kind of a small town. They're not the biggest players on the board. The feds are going to eat the serpents alive if it comes to it. And a shit ton of people are going to go to jail. Which, you know, kind of given the sort of stuff the serpents do, is probably not undeserved. But still, these are people that Jughead's dad cares about and has taken you know, a level of responsibility for looking after their welfare, even if they are not the most morally upstanding people in the world. And in all fairness, the South Side people do have genuine grievances against the North Side. Everybody seems to look down on them, to assume that they're bad people, that they're criminals. And if, you know, you spend half your whole life having people look down on you and, and think you're a criminal just because you're poor, well... It's certainly not right that people decide to embrace that, but it's certainly at least emotionally understandable. And this episode does a nice job of showing that, um, you know, while he prefers to deal, use his mind to, uh, to deal with situations, Jughead is uh, nobody to, to sniff at in terms of just pure determination and even to a surprising degree physical ability. You know, Jughead Jones is is uh, is no pusher, no uh, he's no milk toast. He he can take he can take it. And uh, now that he's a member of the Serpents, full fledged, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. Especially now that he seems to have uh, coal, you know, some genuine sparks in terms of kissing and such are going on with Tony. And he still owes Penny Peabody a favor, which is doubtlessly going to end extraordinarily badly for Jughead. So, yes, lots of interesting things going on this episode. Uh, nicely done. I mean, let's let's also stop, pause for a moment. This is an episode of Archie where we basically saw pretty much everybody but Betty and Jughead getting high. I mean, wow. Let's ponder that for a moment. Okay, guys, I'm going to call it here. Uh, as always, please comment, rate, and subscribe. And of course, you can follow me on Twitter at Who's Your Jedi. And please also join me on Tumblr at Jedi Reviewer. Until next time, take care and have a good one.